Thanks for joining me for another episode of Blake's Medical Bombs and Knowledge. I'm your host, the one and only Blake Briggs, MD. As always, before we get started, you know you can find me on Patreon. Click the link below. Also, you can buy my book on Amazon, which covers most of the stuff we're talking about today. If you want a more in-depth analysis, click Patreon link below or visit Amazon. Let's get started. Today we'll be covering bradycardia. That's one of those big issues that I feel like students don't get a good grasp of their first two years. You know, there's a culmination of causes of bradycardia that you have to worry about. And so I came up with this mnemonic uh, several months ago, and I think this is a great quick review of just causes you need to be thinking about when you walk into a room and you see a patient and they have a low heart rate. So let's go over it right now. We'll be basically tracking all the causes of bradycardia right up here in this little corner of imagination. I'm pointing to this blank space, not my brain, which could be blank too. But we'll be covering the mnemonic with bradycardia. And the mnemonic is awesome because it tells you the treatment. The mnemonic is going to be atropine. For A, we need to think about anterior ischemia, meaning an anterior myocardial infarction. The most common cause of myocardial infarction in the world. That's going to be anterior infarction. T of atropine is going to be thyroid issues. When we think thyroid, we also think of endocrine issues, other ones. And so we'll be thinking of adrenal issues too. So we think of either, what, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, most common cause of hypothyroidism in the world, or adrenal insufficiency or adrenal failure, which can also cause bradycardia. The loss of cortisol means loss of catecholamines, loss of epinephrine, the loss of the inherent inotropic and systemic vascular resistance that cortisol normally supplies. So that's thyroid and adrenal issues. Our R is going to be rhythm disorders. So this is where most people, I think, know in terms of causes of bradycardia when we think rhythm disorders. So those, of course, would be the heart blocks, classically, or the bundle branch blocks. Um, these will be, of course, first degree, second degree, and third degree heart blocks. We think of, of course, first degree heart block, which is the most benign and classically on every test question. They always want you to do something for these people. You don't do anything. You just send them home as long as they're asymptomatic. And in every test question I've seen, they're asymptomatic. The classic case is some 55-year-old, he comes in for something unrelated. And he comes in and, you know, he says he's fine, he's no, not feeling faint, he's not short of breath, he doesn't have any chest pain. You look at his EKG and it shows a prolonged PR interval, and that's first-degree heart block. We don't do anything for that as long as they're asymptomatic or have no other problems going on. Second-degree heart block is going to divide up into type 1 and type 2. This is where it gets confusing. This is going to be that Mobitz type 1 or Mobitz type 2. And again, this isn't supposed to be an encompassing review of EKGs. I'm doing a rapid mnemonic review of kind of what's going on with the causes of bradycardia here. So remember that second degree type 1 heart block is going to be basically a progressive prolonging of the PR interval. And eventually, about every three beats, classically, we will drop a QRS complex. Mobitz type 2 is a little more serious. It's kind of crossing the threshold. The first degree heart block and then second degree, Mobitz type 1, those two are usually benign. We usually just keep an eye on them. We don't, don't do anything for them. But the latter two, Mobitz type 2 and third degree, we usually progressively treat those. We do things for those because they can lead to more serious causes of heart disease. So, like I said, this Mobitz type 2 second degree heart block, this is going to be classically the PR interval does not progressively get longer. It stays the same length, but as it marches through, you still drop a QRS complex about every third beat, typically. And then finally, the third degree heart block, which is one of the coolest EKGs, I think, to see. As an emergency physician, I just love looking at those types of EKGs because they're just so wild. And it's basically the P waves and the QRS complexes march at their own paces. They do not correlate to each other at all, and they classically can be mapped out separately using a caliper or just a pen. And what I use, I don't have any fancy calipers. And classically, they're doing their own thing. Neither of them correlate with each other at all. So that's going to be rhythm disorders. Oh, we're going to be overdoses. So we think of some classic drugs that cause bradycardia. There's a whole list of them, right? But I'm talking about the board relevant, the high yield stuff, and the common stuff. That happens a lot. Classically, probably the most common here is going to be our beta blockers. Beta blockers are the most common drug, especially in the elderly that have heart disease already or previous heart attacks. So they can come in with bradycardia. Classically, they would usually also have um, hypoglycemia too on test questions due to that inhibition of the CAMP. C-A-M-P, cyclic A-M-P, and thus you, you know, have hypoglycemia as a result. Another overdose, of course, would be calcium channel blockers, also causing bradycardia. And then finally, digoxin can also cause bradycardia as well. Pressures. And so when I think of pressure, I think of increased intracranial pressure. So this is going to be the Cushing's reflex. So we think of the Cushing's reflex as going to be mapping toward that triad, right, of bradycardia, hypertension, and irregular breathing. It's out of the scope of today's little talk to discuss the effects of and the causes of the Cushing triad, 
Right now, you need to know that the Cushing's reflex is basically that triad, um, and it's a mix of symptoms that develop due to impending herniation. The brainstem, as it moves down in the foramen magnum, will begin to be compressed, and thus different aspects of the brainstem stop working. Some are stimulated or compressed, and so that's why you have this mix of autonomic signals, of bradycardia at the same time you have hypertension, but then abnormal breathing as well. I is going to be inferior myocardial infarction. You're probably like, Blake, we already covered myocardial infarction. And so this is for two reasons. One, anterior myocardial infarctions are the most common cause of myocardial infarctions, but the inferior myocardial infarctions cause hypotension a lot more. That's because, of course, the effect of the inferior aspect of the myocardial tissue that's basically vascularized by the right coronary artery. The right coronary artery also helps with return of venous blood, right? And so if we infarct this area, venous blood will not really have much effort of coming back into the heart and because of that, we have a lower preload unless your blood pressure drops, hypotension. So inferior myocardial infarction is classically associated with hypotension. That's why when these patients come in, you see an inferior myocardial infarction on their EKG, you don't give any nitroglycerin. The N is numbing or nippy, if you will, if you're, depending what region of the world you're from. That's gonna imply cold temperature. So hypothermia is classic for bradycardia, especially in the elderly. So the elderly are more prone to hypothermia in board questions than in real life, just because of the fact that they have decreased muscle mass, they have decreased abilities if they're demented or in a nursing home or unable to move around themselves the decreased ability to maintain their own body warmth. So that's classically gonna be a hypothermia patient. It's gonna be an elderly person who lives alone or was found somewhere, or a homeless person in the winter especially. So these people need to be actively rewarmed, um, and there's different stages of rewarming we won't get into today as well. But classically, these people come with bradycardia, and they're prone to asystole as well as atrial fibrillation due to the um, basically the sensitivity of their heart muscle. And finally, E. Good old E is going to be the classic case of bradycardia induced by hyperkalemia. It's the dialysis patient, right? The person that misses dialysis for at least a day, sometimes like two days or three days if you're a really bad dialysis patient, which is sadly too common. And this patient came in and they were, you know, struggling to breathe. They felt short of breath. Everybody has those famous high potassiums that I feel like in conferences, doctors try to out-compete each other for, oh, well, I saw a potassium in this one time. No, well, I saw this. So anyway... This potassium is like 8.7. I think it's my record. I'm post in the comments below if you've seen one higher. So potassium of 8.7, and of course they're bradycardic, and we initiate the hyperkalemic treatment in the ER here, and we send them up to the ICU. So that's going to be it for this mnemonic of atropine. I encourage you, if you like what you see here, go to my Patreon page, which you can click in the link below right up here. Also, if you like kind of what I'm doing right here, this is how I teach. This is how I do things. I love tutoring. And so my book is on Amazon as well. You can have the link to that right over here as well as down here. Thanks for listening. See you next time.